Welcome to the Sourcing Hero podcast produced by UNA, a group purchasing organization that empowers sourcing heroes and Art of Procurement, the world's largest procurement podcast network. I'm your host, Kelly Barner. The goal of the Sourcing Hero podcast is to capture the epic stories of people who are rising up and beating the odds to create exceptional value within procurement directly from those heroes themselves. Today, my guest here on the Sourcing Hero podcast is Jane Friedel. Jane is a vertical market manager at Pitney Bowes, a tech company best known for its postage meters and other mailing equipment and services. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for the introduction. Of course. And I am positive that there's more to your professional background than your current job. So for folks that haven't yet had the opportunity to meet or connect with you, can you share a little bit more about your professional journey to this point? Absolutely. So I actually have been with Pitney Bowes for 33 years at this point. That's um, amazing. Which I, I'd like to wear not as a badge of honor for my accomplishment, but just for uh, for knowing that it was a wonderful company to work for. Yes. You're always going to get a paycheck from them, which sometimes <laughs> with some companies isn't always a given. That so is true. And I've learned a lot over the years. I started... Um, as I've been everything from a sales rep on selling postage meters up and down the street to having a territory of the entire Southeast and, and um, driving around and, and a national sales trainer and working in particular vertical markets. And um, I really now, I, I believe I have the best job in the company with what I do and I certainly enjoy it. Well, that's good to hear. Everyone should feel that way about their job, know, if at right? all humanly possible. And in that 33 years, you've seen a thing or two change, but probably nothing like the rate and the degree of the change that we've seen over the last couple of years. And Correct. one of the notable changes that I'd be interested to talk with you about today is this working from home movement, which was a surprise to everyone, but now doesn't seem to be going away. What would you say have been some of the biggest challenges from a communication standpoint that right. you've heard from or seen companies trying to work through um, as, as their workforces went remote, in some cases stayed remote three, four days a week? Um, what are some of the communications changes that you've seen? Well, and interesting enough, I've actually worked remotely for almost my entire career with Pitney Bowes, and um, just the term of working remotely has taken on different um, connotations over the years. Uh, but a lot of the things that I've noticed that, that are, the difference is, is really in timing. Um, you know, it used to be where you would have, uh, it was acceptable to have a 24 hour cushion to respond to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, but now everybody wants a response right away. Um, if they send you, if I get a message from somebody in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, they're thinking about me right now. They have a, an answer on the top of their head about me right now. I'm going to do everything that I possibly can do to respond to them while I have their attention. And oftentimes the initial response will then lead into a bigger conversation if you're able to communicate with them. I do find, though, uh, one of the things that people have too many different ways of communicating. <laughs> we have Twitter, we have LinkedIn, yeah. we have email, we have text messages, we have, you know, five different types of calendars. You have your Outlook calendar, your Google calendar, that trying to coordinate and getting all that organized um, sometimes takes a challenge, but I think that that's that's really important. But one of the, like I said, the biggest communications challenges is really the timing. Um, and especially if it is something that's a hard copy that has to be mm -hmm. sent. Uh, you know, people might think that physical mail is going away. Um, it's not. Um, there's still a lot of activity in the FedEx and, and the overnight world. And um, you know, you got to be there to receive it and you got to know that it's been been shipped. So there are there are still a lot of challenges with communications um, going through 
in the world today. No, that's absolutely true. And and adapting to those is something of a double challenge because we're trying to deal with the change. But then I think all of us are trying to figure out, you know, we keep talking about this next normal or new normal, which presumes a level of stability that I'm starting to think is not coming. I'm I'm keeping hope alive, but we do seem to be just going into a period of continual change, which means that we can't necessarily re-optimize for any new period, thinking that it's going to be around for a, a fixed length of time. And this was something that you and I had previously spoken about. I think you called it sort of the challenge of the moment, figuring out which of these new communications methods are probably going to be the way we continue to work for a while and which are meeting some type of short-term need. What are your opinions about that? You know, I absolutely think that um, remote meetings are going to continue. I know that within the Pitney Bowes world, we actually, before uh, the pandemic, shut down all of our local demo sites and we had a remote online demo site because it was a lot easier for someone who wanted to see something to just go onto their computer as opposed to having to get in the car, drive someplace, take the whole day. Um, so I think that we, the technology has been wonderful on that aspect. I think that it's given people length to their careers, um, that they're be able to they're able to work in different scenarios. You don't have to always be physically present, but you can be present um, on a remote call. I think that's going to stay. However, I don't think it's going to be exclusive like it was for the last two years. At least I hope it's not going to be exclusive because, quite <laughs> frankly, as convenient as that may be, there is nothing like a face to face meeting. Um, I am now starting to go back to conferences and when you meet somebody face to face, there's a a special connection that you have with them, that you remember them. You maybe talk about something other than work. You're not looking at your calendar and saying, oh, I have a hard stop in 10 minutes because I have another call. Um, I, I, I really hate that when you get on a call and somebody says, oh, I have a hard stop. So, you know, hurry up and say what you want to say mm-hmm. and then, then move on. Um, but that's the way that it is. So I'm hoping that that changes, that we do go back to having some face-to-face meeting. But I will tell you one thing that I don't think is ever going to go away, and that's hard copies and that's packages. And that is the need to actually send somebody something, um, do we see a lot um, digitally? Yes. But quite frankly, you and I would, would be lying if we didn't say we don't read all of our email advertisements that come through there. Um, <laughs> people have started going back towards um, mail for advertising yeah. because it is a little bit more personal and it's you, you're looking at it. Um, there will always be delivery of packages as well as uh, legal documents, uh, people that just want hard copies of stuff. But what's really important these days is we can't always um, count on the actual time that it was sent, that it was sent to the right place, when it was delivered, who it got delivered to. So you really are going to have to be careful about making sure that you have ways to be able to, one, check that the address is correct. With the pandemic, a lot of places closed. A lot of people started working remotely. Uh, people changed titles or they changed, they changed addresses for whatever. So there are, um, you know, software programs out there that will give you the, any address updates. And that's really important because shipping is not cheap. Um, FedEx just announced, UPS just announced they're going to have upcharges for the holiday season. So you don't want to be wasting money on shipping no. to a wrong address because they will find the right address for you and then they will charge you for having to find that right address. So you want to make sure that you're doing it correctly from the beginning. Then you also want to make sure that you have a an accurate way of tracking when the, the piece was sent, whether it's a package or, or a letter. Um, who sent it, who's going to pay for this shipping, when it was received, if it was received at a shipping dock, did it actually get to the person who it was addressed to? There's a lot of steps along the way that could something could go wrong. So you want to make sure that, that you have that um, 
at hand that you're able to, to work with that. And then the other thing that's really important with remote workers, you don't want to be that person that has to mail something. You have to spend a half an hour to an hour going to the post office, standing in line, then you have to come back and then you have to, I don't know, do an expense report for $2 worth yeah. of stamps. Um, you know, all of that is time consuming. And as we know, time is what people are, are lacking right now. So you do not want to do all that. So the other thing that's important is to have an easy way to pay for any of these services that you're using, as well as being able to um, track a, an accounting basis, who who was paying for it, what was it for, and then every once in a while, go back and look at it and say, did we really need to send that package for eight o'clock delivery? Would noon have been okay? And there's ways to do an analysis of, of shipping charges. So there's going to be a lot of things that are here to stay. And the, the thing that's really here for, to stay is a tracking every penny, because every penny is become, going to become more valuable, especially in the shipping world. So you want to make sure that you're doing it the most efficiently and effective for the best price, meaning your, your uh, company uh, rules, and your delivery objective. I do agree with you that hard copy isn't going away. And I think in some cases, it's because something is so important, right? That it needs to travel hard copy. But there is also that implied weight with something physically showing up. And whether that's because you're trying to communicate a little bit of seriousness or gravitas with something that you're sending out, or whether you're being opportunistic. I can certainly see I'm guilty as charged, Jane. I do not open all of my promotional emails. <laughs> no, right? But when something glossy and impressive comes in the mail, I will admit I am more likely to stop and focus on that. I might leave it on my desk and look again later. So I can see some strategic opportunism associated with going hard copy when the ROI is there. And to your point, that means understanding not only the R piece of the ROI, but also the I part, being right. able to quantify in advance so that you can make a decision, is this the right thing to send physically versus whatever our myriad of options are to send things digitally. Um, and you know, it would be easy to think that when we're talking about hard copy communications, that's only things that are being sent from companies to employees or from companies to partners and suppliers, right? Sort of commercial business to business. But I'm sure there are also cases where you have professionals working from home that need to send something hard copy back to the mothership or that need to send something hard copy to a supplier or a customer from home. And so as we start to think about it, there are probably a lot more times that this is happening now and a lot more people trying to figure out a new system for it than you might think on first glance. No, absolutely. So the post office numbers, um, you know, first class mailing, which is typically your statement and invoices, which a lot of that now is happening um, over the internet has decreased, but without a doubt shipping has, is going through the roof. Um, and there, there now are some additional players in the shipping world, but it's, you know, less people are going out to the stores and, and are going anywhere and they're doing the shipping. And, you know, there's a lot to it when you're doing shipping. It's not just putting something in the box and seeing how much it costs and dropping it off. You want to make sure that there's all different ways that you can, uh, different rates that you can pick different surcharges. Um, do you want electronic return receipt? That's a lot cheaper than, than doing paper method return receipt. So there's a lot of different things that you really have to understand. What is it that you're trying to mail or ship? What is the purpose of it? What do you need to have? Do you need to have proof of mailing? Um, do you need to want to make sure that the addresses are updated? So there's a lot of different different um, options in your in the solutions that are available to you. And you want to tailor it to what you need to have done. You don't want to say, okay, here's here's a product, make it work for you, right? You want to say, okay, I use FedEx, I use UPS, I use um, a shipping company, I use, you know, LTL. I want to have all my own rates in my software program and I want them updated. And that's the other thing is keeping everything updated. You may that's think right. you have the great system, but things change. So you want to, that's the, you want to be sure that it's updated and if it's SaaS-based, it makes it easier to happen. So these are all great things for 
um, purchasing professionals, procurement professionals to think about uh, when they are looking for a, a way to make sure that they're using their best options and saving money. You know, it's interesting because we've talked about a couple of different tracking challenges. And I'm sure, you know, the minute people started working from home, the correct address field in everybody's database everywhere was broken sort of in an instant. Uh, but what about auditing? What sorts of auditing capabilities do you think it's important for companies to have when it comes to either managing individual hard copy shipments that they're sending or simply looking back over their demand and, and figuring out how much volume, how much spend do they have in this area? Right. So auditing um, is on every, every level, whether it's the audit of a single package that you can audit when it left to when it got delivered. Did it get delivered? Did something happen to it once it was delivered? Being able to audit trail of a single package to auditing of an overall department spend. Um, you know, why is so much of this um, going overnighted when UPS next day is it anyway? From here to there is one day to begin with. Why are we having to pay extra charges for that? To also, you know, what department is doing amount of spend? Um, are there options? A lot of the places, especially the USPS now, is doing what's called work share, where you will pay less if you prepare your packages a little bit differently. Hmm. But on top of that, you get a better service. So it gets delivered faster and you're paying less money for it, which is unheard of in the business world. So there are a lot of ways that you can look at that. But the auditing is is more important than now than ever Um and, you know, we do have, Penny Bowes has a way that we do data capture where we look at how much was spent on first class, how much of it was priority mail, um, all that information, right? Everything is about data, data mining now, right? So all that information is part of um, your, your every day. Everything that you're sending out is you can go back and you can look at it and you can see, you know, what day of the week are you doing more? Are you doing a lot of Saturday deliveries that are going out on Friday? Why don't we send them on Thursday and it gets it on Friday and it's not, not as expensive. So there's all kinds of ways that you can audit from individual packages to company processes. And if you're a procurement professional that enjoys sort of the complex, meaty optimization scenario, based on what you're saying, this sounds like a great opportunity to geek out on data and look at your options. And like you said, does it really need to go Friday and arrive on Saturday? Does it need to be there before noon or is there more flexibility? It sounds like there are a lot of options to explore alternative time frames and service levels and packaging you you mentioned um, to reduce cost without actually affecting the quality of the service that's being received. Well, don't all procurement professionals like to geek out on stuff like that? <laughs> like that. It's, I that's so. the all reason the why they too. are procurement <laughs> professionals and they're so good at what they do and probably why I am not one. But yes, absolutely. The, the, the more data, the more information that we can get, um, we can use it to our benefit and, you know, with everything from labor shortages to supply chain issues, to the cost of transportation, um, the more information that you can get and then use to your benefit, the better. Absolutely. That's true. Now, Jane, as we wrap up our time talking about this, mm -hmm. I want to ask you, well, it's a set of questions and this is part of the tradition here at the Sourcing Hero. So I'm going to give you two options, and you can answer whichever one of these questions you like. So your choices are, how would you explain what a sourcing hero is? Or if you'd like to take a broader approach, how would you describe what heroism looks like in a business context? Um, I think I would like to go with the business context. Um because everybody, I'm sure the first thing that they would say would be responsiveness. But I think that there's more to it than that. You need to know who your audience is. You need to know about the company. You need to, when, I, when someone reaches out to me, before I respond back to them, I'm Googling them to find out, you know, what it is that they do. Where are they located? How many locations do they have? Not so I can presume what their applications are going to be, but just so that I can understand some of what they're talking to me about. So hero, heroism in a business context starts first with your research. 
So you want to do your research. And, and if they are a current client, you want to make sure that you go back and you don't want to be blindsided and go in there and say, oh, we've had problems like this. You ought to be able to go back into company records, notes, whatever, just to see what the history is. Then, of course, responsiveness has got to happen. And, you know, it's interesting. We were talking about some of the changes. It used to be I'd be driving down the road, pull over, use a phone booth. Somebody would read me a message off a pink note and I wouldn't have to get back <laughs> to them till the next day. Well, now people are looking for something right away, even if it's just as thank you for reaching out to me. I will be looking into this. I may not have an answer right now, but I will find one for you. And that's good. But then you have to have the follow up that goes along with it. So on my side, I also need to know who to go to. So I have to understand, OK, this is an issue that maybe I don't know how to resolve. Who am I going to go to? So, again, research is involved with that. And then the follow up with with the client. Um, but the whole reason for this is that we're trying to not only make their experience with a supplier or a vendor as painless as possible, but we also want to give them another reason to do business with us. And that is to show some value and to save some money because they are going to be, if we, if we think that they're not going to be looking around and looking at pricing and doing a big analysis, um, that's not right. You should always assume that somebody is, is checking you. So you want to make sure that you're doing your job correctly that you are also honest in all your answers. If you don't know an answer, just say, I don't know an answer. Don't make one up and then hope it's right. So you really want to be honest. And at Pitney Bowes, um, we do have a saying that, that goes on, on every level, do the right thing the right way. So oftentimes I will have that going through my brain before I send the response. What is the right thing? Let me do it the right way. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's what I, I think. But you know what, quite frankly, is that heroism? That ought to be the way everybody should be conducting business to begin with. Um, you know, maybe going above and beyond is a little bit more of heroism and doing it in, you know, all weekend long or, or, you know, responding or whatever. But still, these should be common everyday practices for people. And I, I, uh, and I'm sure most of the folks on this call would, would agree with that. And the procurement people would, would agree that that's what they're looking for. I love that statement about do the right thing the right way. And based on your heroism answer, I would actually add to that and say, do the right thing the right way, even when no one is looking. Because that sounds like what you're saying. It's about doing the right thing, not because you might get caught not doing it or you might get caught doing the wrong thing, but it's because you know what you're ultimately trying to affect Right, which is helping that customer, helping that company, delivering savings if you're in procurement. And, and I agree with you. We should all be operating by that principle. I'm, I'm sure some of us have you know, good days and bad days yes, and a mix of yes, things. We do. <laughs> but that's certainly the aspiration. That's true. That's true. Sometimes we have good mornings and bad afternoons. So it's, all, <laughs> it's okay. within the course of the day. But as long as we can remind ourselves and get grounded and go back. And if you've done something wrong, apologize. I mean, there's been many a time where I've, I've missed an email and somebody's had to get back in touch with me. And, you know, that disturbs me more than anything else. So absolutely apologize. You know, I'm sorry that this has happened. Let's see if we can fix it. Absolutely. Jane, if anybody has listened into this conversation and wants to connect with you, wants your advice, wants your opinion, wants your insight, what is the best way for them to get in touch? Well, thank you for asking that. Um, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't say our Pitney Bowes website would be is a great place to start if there's any um, interest in anything that I've talked about. And that's just a pitneybows.com. Um, and my email is simply jane.fordell. Fordell has two D's and two L's at pitneybows.com. And I am also on, on LinkedIn. Um, I don't post as often as I would like to because hopefully I'm responding to, uh, to customers <laughs> all day long. But <laughs> I do check it every once in a while. So I am also on LinkedIn at Jane Fordell. Excellent, Jane. Thank you so much for being here with me on the Sourcing Hero podcast. Well, Kelly, this has been wonderful. And again, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sourcing Hero podcast. 
Join us again next time for more true stories of sourcing and business heroism performed by your colleagues and peers. Look for The Sourcing Hero wherever you get your podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe. Finally, don't forget, sourcing heroism is taking place all around us every day. Keep your eyes open and you're bound to see it. Until next time, I'm your host, Kelly Barner. Stay well and always remember that you can be a hero too.